Thank you very, very much for the, the, the warm introduction. Um, the real privilege to participate in this uh, really, really well thought out um, virtual symposium. Um, so my job has been made a lot, lot easier uh, by Kurt and Steve, who really have very eloquently kind of outlined the challenges that we face in the care of these patients who are often the most complex, uh, critically ill, <clears throat> and patients with dynamic physiology. And I think I really, really enjoyed uh, Kurt's talk about deconstructing hypoxia. And uh, Kurt alludes to the fact that perhaps there may be differences in what we say. I actually don't think there are going to be too many differences um, in our thinking about this condition. and. I just have kind of relabeled the title of my talk to include reconstructing health because that really is what we are trying to achieve. So all of us take care of babies like this on a on a day-to-day -day basis. These are infants that present with profound hypoxemia and who uh, represent you know the infants that give us the most challenges when i started off in neonatology a baby is coming to the nicu satting 60 percent in 100 percent oxygen um nitric oxide and the oscillator were wheeled in like husband and wife routinely regularly they were placed oftentimes without thinking and while that might be the right approach for certain patients we need to think much more beyond and the importance, and both Steve and Kurt alluded to clinical phenotyping, the importance of precision. We need to evolve to a sophistication of care in which we're actually dealing with the problem, not dealing with what we think might be the problem or our best educated guess. And to do that, one needs more information. So quickly just refreshing a few concepts that I think are very, very important when we think about this particular condition. Uh, Kurt has already showed you that it takes time for your pulmonary artery pressure to fall because of the normal changes in pulmonary vascular resistance. And Steve also talked about the, the dangers of oxygen and certainly the hazards of giving too much oxygen. And certainly when you look at the relationship physiologically between oxygen or PO2 and PVR, across a normal range of PO2s, there's really not much added advantage from a physiologic perspective in augmenting your PO2. And it's really important to recognize in health that there are three main factors at play when it comes to the normal changes in oxygen saturations in the first few minutes after birth. We've already talked about these. We oftentimes focus on lung recruitment as the most important thing. And, and it is, it's important, but changes in pulmonary vascular resistance and the adaptive response of the right ventricle to these changes are also incredibly important determinants of the normal changes in pulmonary blood flow. And oftentimes we forget about this. And I think you're gonna hear this over and over again. There are situations in which the problem may be the lung. There are situations in which the problem may be the heart. There are situations in which the problem may be blood vessels. It's really, really important to not lose sight of the fact that the role of the right ventricle, particularly in the transitional period, is incredibly important. The graph on the left is the relationship between heart function and afterload, wall stress in premature infants. And you can see in the top left that the immature neonate has got a much steeper line than the older child, meaning that increments in afterload lead to a greater decrement in contractility. Now, if you look at the right versus the left ventricle, what you can see is that the right ventricle may be even more sensitive to afterload. And that's quite interesting. We just published a normative data set in a cohort of babies kind of in Toronto, showing that the RV lags behind the LV in its normal postnatal adaptation. The third concept that's really, really important when it comes to managing the most critically ill babies with pulmonary hypertension is the relationship of heart rate to contractility. The graph on the left is the force frequency relationship, which shows that as heart rate increases, 
contractility will also increase, but to a point after which you may get fall-offs in contractility at extremes of tachycardia. However, this is only working if the changes in heart rate are effective in augmenting heart function. And if you have an infant with a profoundly dysfunctional right ventricle, which we often tend to see particularly in cases in which the ductus is restrictive, you have a blunted force frequency relationship in which tachycardia causes tachycardia and not a lot else. And what you end up then further compromising is diastolic perfusion as coronary arteries are only perfused during diastole, the faster the heart rate, the lower the filling time. So you may end up making a bad situation even worse. The other important concept, and I think it's very, very relevant with respect to the care of infants with pulmonary hypertension is the relationship between blood pressure and this illness. We have elevated blood pressure to a, an almost godly status in terms of it is the metric that we adjudicate health versus disease. But if you look at these two pictures of babies we took care of over the last couple of years, both look very sick, but none of them have low blood pressure. And therefore, it's really, really important to not lose sight of the fact that blood pressure does not predict cardiac output. And in pulmonary hypertension, that relationship may even be more tenuous, in particular, if there's an infant with a wide open duct with a right to left shunt given the fact that we oftentimes monitor blood pressure through an umbilical arterial line, and the blood pressure we are measuring may not necessarily be reflective of the perfusing pressure of the brain in the presence of a very large right to left shunt. Kurt has already showed this to you. I'm not going to go into it in any detail, but again, this relationship between oxygen delivery and oxygen consumption in optimizing cellular metabolism is the hallmark of what we need to do in these patients. And if we change the focus from blood pressure to determinants of oxygen delivery, there's a complexity and a need for physiologic individualization of care that's incredibly important. So Kurt has already talked about PPHN or acute pulmonary hypertension. We like to talk about acute and chronic pulmonary hypertension, but in essence, we're talking about the same condition. Kurt spoke about that this is a shades of blue, shades of gray, shades of green, whatever you like to call it. Uh, but it's a condition that oftentimes our thinking physiologically moves away from what the problem is and starts to think about the consequences of the problem. There are some challenges that we face on a day-to-day -day basis. The first one is we lose sight of the fact that this is a disease of right ventricular afterload. We oftentimes spend more attention thinking about what is the blood pressure, what is the number of the blood pressure that I want to achieve. And by doing that, you then start forgetting or not considering with the degree of precision what's going on at the level of the pulmonary vascular bed. The other important things to consider in this condition is that there are certain things that may lead you down a garden path. Not all babies with a pre post ductal oxygen saturation difference have pulmonary hypertension. Some may have congenital heart disease. And not all babies who don't have a pre post ductal oxygen saturation difference, you can exclude pulmonary hypertension. In our experience, the sickest babies are those in whom the ductus is closed, the RV is failing, and they present with profound hypoxemia without a pre post ductal saturation difference. And as mentioned previously, the challenges of using blood pressure and in particular relying on postductal blood pressure and not thinking about preductal blood pressure, which really is much more reflective of the adequacy of pulmonary blood flow. So how do we think about pulmonary hypertension? Well, very simply, we think about this very much from a resistance perspective as a brick wall in the lungs, either due to lung disease or due to non-pulmonary reasons, there may be elevation in pulmonary vascular resistance. And again, bear in mind, I'm focusing for now on those conditions that cause elevated PVR. The problem, our thinking, tends to focus on um, creating a roadblock in the lung. 
are in the, in the systemic circulation as a means to try to reroute blood into the lung, which if it is effective, may have some benefit, but in our experience causes more harm than good. The other final concept, and I think Phil would probably go into this in a lot more detail that's important, is not losing sight of the fact that in these profoundly ill babies with the most elevated pressure, what happens to the right ventricle and this maladaptive response to elevated pulmonary vascular resistance, particularly when the ductus is closed, will lead to a dilated, decompensated right ventricle. And this is what we call heterotropic maladaptation. The other final physiologic concept, just to mention briefly, is also in many of these conditions, the right and the left ventricle are incredibly interdependent. The fibers of the RV and the LV are shared and an insult to the right ventricle may oftentimes cause a secondary insult to the left ventricle. And this is also important when it comes to selecting cardiovascular drugs. So I wanna start off with a case. I'm gonna use a series of cases to illustrate a series of points with respect to the care of this very complex condition. This is an infant who was born at full term in an institution in another province in Canada, who was born by emergency section for fetal distress. The infant initially had some respiratory distress, but was well and did not have hypoxemia. He was known antenatally to have a concern about a cerebral AV malformation. This was confirmed on postnatal MRI, as you can see in the image on the right-hand side. At the referral hospital, initially, as mentioned, the baby had a normal lactate and normal urinary output and was in room air. An echocardiogram was performed by the local pediatric cardiology service, which demonstrated suprasystemic pulmonary hypertension with a dilated dysfunctional right ventricle. The baby was then started on some debutamine, which again would be our first line therapy like Kurtz for some RV dysfunction, particularly in the mild to moderate range. And they also started nitric oxide based on this finding of suprasystemic pulmonary hypertension. Over the next four to six hours, the baby became uh, sicker. There was increase in respiratory distress. There was oliguria. And when they repeated this baby's blood work, the lactate, which had been normal, was now 10, and the child had profound acidosis. It was anuric at this point in time. So the assumption was that this infant's pulmonary hypertension and RV dysfunction was getting worse. Or they missed something else. Perhaps it was congenital heart disease, so they started the baby on prostaglandin. So this infant arrived at our center on nitric of 20, debutamine of 10, and prostin of 0 0.03 with profound oliguria and lactic acidosis. So one of the key elements of achieving the precision that Kurt and Steve talked about is precision in echocardiography. And within our center, we have a comprehensive hemodynamics program in which we have five neonatologists who are trained in uh, advanced echocardiography, and they use this to define physiology, not at a single time point, but at multiple time points, evaluate the response to therapy, and as neonatal intensivists to take this information and integrate it carefully in the clinical care. So when we scan this baby, what do we find? Well, we did find that he had suprasystemic pulmonary hypertension, but this was not pulmonary hypertension that was driven by resistance. This was driven by flow. You can see here a very dilated dysfunctional right ventricle and the objective measures confirmed that there was at least moderate RV dysfunction. But when you look at his, uh, his other kind of images, you can see the significant retrograde flow in the postductal arch and this very dilated torrential SVC. So what did we do? We recommended to the team to stop the nitric oxide to switch him from dibutamine to low dose epinephrine. And within several hours, this infant improved, the lactate normalized, his urinary output also normalized. So this gets back to something that was asked to Kurt. Uh, what about flow? There are some conditions that by their pathological nature do lead to an increase in flow. This infant did not need nitric oxide. 
this infant needed his AV malformation to be managed. And if you now think of the physiology of this particular infant here, we have this giant vacuum cleaner in the brain that is sucking all this blood um, from the postductal circulation. If we give this infant nitric oxide, we then in essence are potentially going to further limit the amount of postductal blood. And by doing this, we ended up creating a pseudocoarctation physiology by limiting this, this essential right to left flow that was needed in this situation here, which emphasizes the critical importance of delineation. What is the determinant of pressure? Is it flow or is it resistance? Or as Kurt pointed out, there in some situations, this may be a left heart disease. So for this reason, our approach to pulmonary hypertension is a multi-parametric approach. This is based on the fact that all echo measurements have their individual variance. In addition, the, the greater the likelihood that you have multiple measurements telling you the same thing, the more certainty you have with respect to the diagnosis. There are really three questions we're asking. One, can we better characterize pulmonary hemodynamics? Two, what is the impact to the right ventricle? And three, what is the impact to the systemic circulation? And these are the three most important questions in pulmonary hypertension that one needs to ask. And at the same time, making sure that the anatomy is normal. It's really important to be comprehensive because subjective assessment is not reliable. This is some data from a study we published several years ago in Toronto, where we took 60 patients, 30 of whom had pulmonary hypertension, and we asked six experts to subjectively say, is the RV dilated? Is the septum flat? Is the RV dysfunctional? Which tends to be the standard of care echo evaluation most people get for pulmonary hypertension. And you can see that the kappa coefficient is incredibly poor. Subjective is subjective. It's not precise and it may not be accurate. Just to further emphasize the point, even with objective measures, these vignettes here that you can see in front of you, this is the same baby with a series of images taken two to three minutes apart. Depending on the image, I can make that right ventricle look bigger or smaller. I can make that septum look flat or not. And it really comes down to the importance of standardization of assessment and image quality and training is everything. But in addition to this, there are several caveats that one needs to think about when you're thinking about pulmonary hypertension and echo. Tricuspid regurgitation is a great way, according to the Bernoulli equation, to quantify right ventricular systolic pressure. However, if the RV is dysfunctional, it may not be reliable. It may actually underestimate the severity of pulmonary hypertension. What about flow across the ductus? Again, very helpful, very useful. Kurt spoke to this. An unrestrictive right to left shunt potentially tells you that your RV pressures are super systemic. But is it always pulmonary hypertension? Here you can see an image showing very, very nicely this blue flow, which reflects an unrestrictive right to left shunt. Case number one is a sick premature infant in 100% oxygen with very low flow. This infant indeed had resistance driven pulmonary hypertension and responded incredibly well to vasodilation and inotropy. But here's a second case of the baby with a wide open right to left shunt who actually does not have RV dysfunction, does not have compromised pulmonary blood flow, actually has got normal cardiac output. And the reason that this baby had a right to left ductal shunt was that his systemic blood pressure was incredibly low. This infant does not have pulmonary artery hypertension. This infant has a bidirectional shunt in the setting of sepsis. And this is something very, very important to, to, to really think carefully about. The flow across the ductus is determined by the transductal pressure difference, which may reflect either a high pulmonary pressure or a really, really low systemic pressure. Briefly and finally, septal wall motion. A useful parameter, objectively, we measure the end systolic eccentricity index. However, in some patients, you may underestimate pulmonary pressure if the patient has systemic hypertension, because you will end up with a retained high pressure in the left ventricle. 
There are better measurements, Phil will probably talk about these, that one can use to objectively quantify RV systolic performance, TAPSI, fractional area change, strain analysis. We're starting to learn that these measurements may actually be very helpful. This is a work from Reagan Giesinger showing that in the setting of perinatal hypoxia ischemia, that the presence of impaired RV function is an independent predictor of poor uh, neurological outcome, not just in terms of the acute phase in the NICU, but also abnormal neurodevelopment outcome at two years of age. So what about treatment? Well, I think, again, the most important aspect of treatment is to focus on what is the problem, which is a problem of pulmonary artery pressure. There are drugs that uh, Satin will talk about, which work on the pulmonary vascular bed. There are drugs you can give to support the right ventricle. And one can look at modulating flow across the ductus, but paying attention to the fact that selecting therapies that will improve systemic blood pressure, but not at the expense of harming the pulmonary vascular bed. Now, I wanna talk about two caveats, and this has come up earlier, and I'll just share some thoughts on this. Nitric oxide and preterm babies. This is some work from uh, Satyan's group when he was in Buffalo, which showed that if you give nitric oxide on the basis of oxygenation problems, the likelihood of identifying a positive response in extremely preterm babies appears to be less. Let me briefly share a case with you. Preterm baby born in a community hospital, uh, was in poor condition, uh, had no lung disease initially, but presented with hypotension and lactic acidosis. The very first echocardiogram that we performed, and again, the details don't necessarily matter, but the infant had moderate LV systolic dysfunction with a low cardiac output state. So we decided at that point in time to transition him from dibutamine to epinephrine. Within the next three hours, his blood pressure recovered, but this infant, because of his very poor perinatal start, developed multiple seizures, ended up being in 100% oxygen. So Steve talked about dynamic. You know, you can't rely on the information three days ago. So we went back three hours later and the physiology was entirely different. The LV had recovered, but as you can see from the TAPSI, the FAC, it was profound RV dysfunction. The flow across the ductus was unrestrictive right to left. So this infant now has a second phenotype, severe pulmonary hypertension with RV systolic dysfunction. So we started him on nitric oxide and I typically start at five. Um, and there's a very specific reason for that. In our experience, the physiology in some babies can change very quickly and very radically. And in particular, we always advise people to focus very carefully on the postductal blood pressure, particularly if their FiO2 improves, and if that happens, to win the nitric oxide. There's not a lot of data. The study that Steve talks about does not exist. A randomized trial based on echo-confirmed pulmonary hypertension, but there is some data, this is our Toronto experience, showing that if you have echo-confirmed pulmonary hypertension, babies, particularly in the transitional period, independent of gestational age, if they have confirmed pulmonary hypertension and echo, may respond. But as mentioned, some of them respond very quickly and very dynamically that the, the pulmonary vascular bed can be highly vasoresponsive. And that's exactly what happened to this baby here. He weaned to room air within 20, 30 minutes. And the team then started to notice him develop postductal hypotension, and then they weaned the nitric oxide. And this is his scan three hours after the receipt of nitric oxide, the physiology had changed to a third physiology. We were now no longer dealing with pulmonary hypertension, but a large torrential left to right ductal shunt for which we then managed it accordingly. So this gets to the importance of phenotypic profiling. If you are to provide the best care and modulate outcomes, you need to understand what is the disease. Let's move from the preterm babies to term babies. And for the last part, I want to focus on critically ill term babies with pulmonary hypertension. We see many babies like this. Patients refer to us with, uh, for ECMO, profoundly ill babies who typically have a course like this. They start off with profound hypoxemia and then they become hypotensive. 
this infant was started on some, some dopamine, had very little response in terms of his blood pressure. The dopamine was increased to 15. He then was treated with some norepi, followed by epinephrine, and the blood pressure was fixed. He had a very good blood pressure. But despite this, he was profoundly tachycardic and remained profoundly hypoxemic. So in arrival to our NICU, we performed an evaluation of this infant. And like many of these babies, they have a very classic phenotype. They have indeed super systemic pulmonary hypertension, but this infant had a very dilated dysfunctional right ventricle and a small restrictive ductus with almost exclusive right to left flow. So how do we think about managing these INO refractory cases of pulmonary hypertension? There are drugs to manipulate PVR, drugs like milrolone, sildenafil. There are drugs to support the right ventricle, positive inotropes like dibutamine, uh, drugs like milrolone to offload the right ventricle, and prostaglandin. And then finally, there are drugs to manipulate flow across the ductus, and Kurt has alluded to these, norepinephrine and vasopressin. Milrolone, I'm going to leave to Satyan to talk about, but there is evidence that at least in refractory cases, it's associated with some improvement in oxygenation and an improvement in the efficacy of heart function. The only caveat I wanted to share that our experience in the setting of hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy of undergoing therapeutic hypothermia, that some babies can get very significant hypotension that can be quite refractory. As you can see here, the red graph reflects babies who got milrolone in the setting of HIE being cooled versus babies who got milrolone in the setting of just regular pulmonary hypertension or babies who are being cooled who did not get milrolone. And you can see this drop off in systolic and diastolic pressure with a significant increase in the modified inotrope score. This may reflect hepatic, impaired hepatic metabolism or renal clearance. I'm not telling you to not use milrolone, but to watch it very carefully. Understanding the phenotypic variance is really important when it comes to understanding blood pressure. And the best scenario or the best situation in which this is, is, is most best demonstrated are infants who are born to an infant of a diabetic mother who may have asphyxia, who present with hypoxemia and hypotension. These three vignettes are three cases of infants who presented in an almost identical position. And you can see that their echo phenotype is entirely different, ranging from on the left, a profoundly underfilled left ventricle from a significant increased mean airway pressure and intrathoracic pressure to RV dysfunction to on the right hand side. This is an infant with a profoundly hypertrophic heart. It's really important to differentiate these situations here because the approach to care is, is completely different. And particularly the case on the right hand side, any drugs that increase heart rate are likely to harm this physiology, which is very much dependent on filling. So why is it important to think about your selection of vasopressors? Well, our standard of care tends to be dopamine because that's what we use and that's what most people do. Yet, what is the evidence that dopamine actually does something of benefit? And I, I could not find a single paper showing any benefit in pulmonary hypertension. All we have is potential animal data suggesting concern. This is Keith Barrington's very nice piglet study, which shows on the left-hand side, increasing doses of dopamine really didn't lead to any benefit in terms of cardiac output, but were associated with a progressive increase in pulmonary pressure. Epi led to a benefit in increasing cardiac output, but it also was associated with an increase in pulmonary pressure. This is not just a single study. This is some work recently in the piglet model from Manu Cherry, who basically showed that whether you use high dose dopamine or lower dose dopamine with epinephrine, the increase you get in systemic blood pressure is less the increase in pulmonary pressure. So that if you're trying to change the systemic to pulmonary artery pressure gradient, you're not likely to do this with, with these particular conditions. What about norepinephrine? Um, we use norepi occasionally, but we are concerned uh, based on this data about its use in the most critically ill babies in 100% oxygen. This is some work from Satyan, 
Hart's group when he was back in Buffalo, showing that in a hyperoxic environment that norepi may actually have a vasoconstricting effect in the lung. Now, this was the only data that we had until this very recent, very elegant cath lab study that was just published about two years ago. And I think this has revealed some very interesting points. They took two groups of children. They gave them milrinone. And you can see after milrinone, systemic and pulmonary vascular resistance fell. They then randomized them to norepi or terlipressin, which is a vasopressin analog. And what you can see is that in the systemic circulation, both norepi and terlipressin led to a recovery in systemic vascular resistance, which would be a desirable thing in the setting of pulmonary hypertension. But if you look at the effect on PVR, you can see that with norepi, the PVR went back up, whereas only in the vasopressin analog did it stay low. So it's for this reason that we like to think about vasopressin in these patients. Why vaso? Well, it's a drug with a dicosmos type of properties. In most of the systemic vascular beds, the V1 receptors act through calcium channels to cause vasoconstriction. But in the pulmonary, coronary, and cerebral, it actually works through enos channels to cause vasodilation. I don't have a randomized control trial to show you, but there are observational data that show in critically ill babies, both term and preterm babies, that it leads to an increase in blood pressure. And this is associated with a reduction in oxygenation index. Dr. Patrick, sorry okay. to interrupt. Can you wind up in five minutes or so? Yeah, we're wrapping up now. So, so how, how did this baby do? So what you can see here is that we switched the baby from dopamine to, to and norepi to vasopressin. Uh, you can see that uh, following that, his blood pressure remained stable, but his heart rate came down very nicely. Once we had a stable blood pressure and a stable heart rate, we then added in some milrinone, and we avoided ECMO in this situation. This baby did incredibly well. So you've seen this in two previous presentations, and you're hearing it again. It's about phenotypic profiling. Pressure is the product of flow times resistance. In providing the best care, it's important to differentiate these particular situations and provide a therapy specific to the underlying problem. So pulmonary hypertension is a physiologic spectrum. Shunts may have a vital role in offloading the right ventricle and the role of prostaglandin. I think it's something important we need to think about. Comprehensive echo helps provide enhanced diagnostic precision, but it needs to be done frequently and longitudinally and care needs to be individualized to the ambient physiology. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Patrick, excellent talk and uh, very, I mean, good continuation from what Kurt presented in the beginning for everyone to understand how the pathophysiology works so you can um, make the decision. So there is uh, one question by Dr. Ahmed, beta-2 stimulation results in pulmonary vasodilation. So, uh, have we tried it for this purpose? So I, I didn't hear the question. What was the question? The beta-2 stimulation also results in pulmonary vasodilation. So is it possible to try it in situations with pulmonary vasoconstriction? I'm not sure what type of drugs that they're, 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 they're thinking about. Obviously, dibutamine is a drug that kind of acts uh, through the beta-2 receptors. Um, I think it's, it's, we don't necessarily know the magnitude of the vasodilator effects. Um, in terms of theoretically, may it have some benefit? Possibly. I'm, I'm not aware of any. Yes, data salbutamol. Excuse me? Yes, suggested salbutamol. Yeah, so sal yeah, I, I, I was going to say, I'm not aware of any studies looking at the effect of salbutamol in this particular situation. I think it'd be something very nice for Satyan to look at in an animal model both through the inhalation route and also through um, um, kind of its um, systemic use, use. Thank you. There is one question from Dr. Sony. Do you use the same guidance for the use of uh, supportive drugs in preterms as compared to term babies? Yeah, exactly. The same thing. So, so our approach is very, very similar. It's, it's very much based on the physiologic premise that we want to you know, support the RV, maximize vasodilation, and maintain a normal blood pressure, but use drugs that are friendly to the pulmonary vascular bed 
Uh, one word of caution uh, is that vasopressin is a drug that should not be used uh, without the appropriate expertise. Um, it's something that can get you into a lot of trouble, particularly with salt balance. Um, we tend to increase sodium content once we see the sodium approach 135. And in addition, it can also lead to a significant polyuria once you stop the drug. So I think you need to have a very clear guideline and protocol for use, but it's not something to just say, start using vasopressin without echo guidance. I think you need to have people with the appropriate expertise to help support the care. The next question is related to this again. I mean, in the example that you mentioned about the use of vasopressin, how do you decide in which case you would consider vasopressin? So just a brief answer. So, so can you repeat the question again, Srinar? In which situation would you consider use of vasopressin as you gave in your illustration? Oh, okay. So I think for us here, you know, when we think about these babies, our goal is to maintain a normal blood pressure. Um, we would typically select vasopressin for those infants who have hypotension. Okay, hypotension with pulmonary hypertension. We would not use it for normal tensive babies. It's our preferred agent for hypotension. Okay, thank you so much. I think uh, due to shortage of time, we'll have to stop the session here, but I hope you'll be there for the panel discussion when you'll be con continuing to contribute. Thank you for the excellent talk. Thanks, Fridar. Well moderated. Thank you so much.